when we set out to do Sorted, and I, I remember there's something that Barry always said, was that he was like, I just, I don't really know what this is going to become, but wouldn't it be cool if one day it could somehow have an influence on people's lives and the way they cook? And we didn't really know what that meant at that time. It could have been a handful of people, or whatever, but the fact that now as many people engage with the content have potentially changed their attitudes towards food, their opinions of food, they've tried dishes they would never normally have tried, or it's forced them to get friends around to eat because they've made something that was too big just for themselves. But it's just, it's amazing how food is something that brings people together time and time again. It is a catalyst for socializing and for friendship, which is why I think Sorted works. Hello and welcome back to Create Podcast from Digital Voices and today we have a very, very exciting guest. I think you're the biggest channel we've had. Size isn't everything. I mean, but you're <laughs> loving it, aren't you? <laughs> Look, we're having a great time. But we're winning. <laughs> we are winning at food. Um, yeah, we have Ben from Sorted Food here, who is, uh, I think, one of the channels that has like shaped YouTube history in the UK. Wow. That's a big claim. That's a bold statement. And I'll take it back later. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself properly? Uh, yeah, so Ben, uh, one of the co-founders of Sorted Food. So Sorted Food is a global channel all around food and cooking, but it's as much about the friendship that we have on screen as it is just about the food itself. You can see here we made Ben into a mad rebel and got him to spray paint, and he's naturally quite good. Um, literally the first time I've ever graffitied anything in my life. He's signing the camera, which you'll see at the end. You can see these clips, and if you say something that you found interesting that Ben says in the podcast in the comments, or something you didn't know, and we will choose a lucky winner to post it to. Interesting. We both have a challenge. I've got to say something interesting, and they've got to identify what it was. So. Sorted food is kind of nearly 10 years old. Does that make you feel old? It does. Um, and, and what makes us feel even more old is when we realise we've known each other even longer. So as friends, we've known each other for 20 plus years since we were 11. And then sort of 10 years later, we started doing YouTube um, off the back of writing a self-published cookbook. Um, there was a, a reiteration before Sorted Food. There was another channel that we, should we say, tested our youtubing on is it still um, live sorted students um and so that we are literally over 10 years on the platform although the channels you see it now yeah coming up 10 years back when you were kind of growing up did you love cooking i mean you actually worked as a chef yeah i, I was came from a very foodie background so my parents were big into food not trained or not professional but we always had great food growing up, always scratch cooking. I, d I didn't know what a ready meal was until I went to university and saw these things that people were eating. Um, uh, so I've always loved food, but it sort of became a career when I decided to go to uni and do culinary arts management. And yeah, look where we end up. Okay, so you were friends in school. Did you always want to work together? Did you make jokes about how you were going to work together or was that not? No, although we've known each other for 21 years, we were in very different groups at school. So Jamie was very much Amdram, um, Barry was very much football team, Mike was kind of music, um, and I was more maths and science. There were obvious overlaps. It wasn't really until the last couple of years of school, sixth form and A-level, that we began to actually hang out together and realise we got more in common than perhaps we thought. Um, and then it was as we went off to university that while we were in our second year at uni, we began to formulate this idea that these skills could come together to create something unique and even then it wasn't a business it was just wouldn't it be cool to do something um a cookbook with my recipes barry's photography an excuse for jamie to do like a marketing project because he was doing marketing at university that wasn't fictional and kind of we could bring all that together um and the book was the answer so it, we never planned to have a business it was just something that evolved how did the idea come up were you sat around halls were you like drinking late one night eating a kebab on the way home like where did all, all of that so we were at different universities doing different things but christmas um semester times we'd come home back to like hometown and we were sat around the pub recounting stories of uh what we were getting up to and one common theme was how terrible everybody's diets were um which surprised and shocked and slightly disappointed me because I was like actually it's really easy and I would literally scribble down recipes on the back of a beer mat and the philosophy was if it fits on a beer mat it's easy enough and simple enough and cheap enough for you to give a go 
and you'll get great results out of it. Um, and it kind of spread from there. So was your diet quite healthy? You were like, guys. <laughs> I wouldn't say it was healthy, but it was definitely <laughs> scratch cooking. Like you still, you can still cook from scratch some terrible things and comfort food and they're really important. Like we should all enjoy food, but on the whole, it wasn't so much of the frozen doner kebabs, which I think was one of the worst examples that Jamie um, told us. And I was just like, not acceptable, try this. Okay, so when you were a student, what was your like go-to your go-to guilt recipe so say you're really hungover or say you're like come back for night out or something um and i I get a lot of stick for it because i keep bringing it back up again now i still love quesadillas so simple thrown together in no time a couple of tortilla wraps molten cheese in the middle and then whatever you can find a bit of chili a bit of spice a bit of fresh cook them up like a great snack and everyone loves them but for many years i kept like how many more how many more versions of quesadilla can we do on the channel because i i just love them yeah Ultimate battle, easy. Ultimate case of deer battle, yeah. bring it on. Yeah. So that was your kind of guilt food? Yeah, simple stuff like that that was one step better than getting a takeaway on the way home. One of my friends at uni used to do oven chips and then he'd open a cold can of baked beans and just pour the cold baked beans on the chips. And I thought it was one of the most disgusting things I'd ever seen in my life. Tinned beans, love them. Baked beans, cold no why? no why yeah exactly i think so did you realize there was a gap and you all kind of wanted to experiment with it and did you think it would just be a one-off project at the beginning? we started as a cookbook yeah. and we, we were all doing our own things and it wouldn't be cool if we all graduated and had this extra thing that we could show for our time and we did it that way and it turns out when you self-publish a book and print it loads you've then got to work out how you sell them um and you know not too metaphorically we had a shed load of them um and it was like how do we sell these before they get damp in the winter um and we did a few videos, basically adverts for the book yeah. and put them on YouTube because YouTube was free yeah. and in our pockets and this thing that had just started. So we thought, well, let's give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? And who had edited? Who, like, who had any video skills at all? Uh, so Barry was doing that at the time um, and was doing all the photography of the book, all the design, the graphic design for um, a website that eventually we did as well. Um, so at the time, Barry was leading like the visual identity um, yeah. and still does today. Um, and and then I was sort of leading on the food and it kind of worked that way. When you first started making these videos, were they ads for the cookbook or were they recipes? They they were ads, but I think we thought and realised, I don't know whether it was accidental or not, but we realised from a very early point, if we were trying to appeal to our peers, um, we were already cynical back then. And I think our generation are even more cynical now, like hate being sold to. Give them something of value, give them something entertaining, give them something inspiring, give them something useful. And so, but surely you'll cr- make, create more demand for it. And that's what we did. Like recipes formed the basis of it. Yeah. They were recipes from the book. Yeah. It was going to lead to interest. Well, if, if this is good, I wonder what else is in the book. And that was the idea. But it wasn't about, hey, buy our book because it's got X, Y, and Z, QVC style. It was very much like, let's give them something that we enjoy making. Hopefully they'll enjoy watching. Yeah, it's funny. I think a lot of brands still struggle to understand that. Even on YouTube, they'll make ads and put them on YouTube. And it's like, no one wants to, no one wants to be sold to. We have that conversation all the time with um, people approaching us and, and brand sponsors, which we love working with different brands on the right grounds. And it's how do we create something bigger and better and interesting for our audience that they want to see? Ideally, they've asked for it rather than we've forced it upon them because you want to do this. And if it's something they're interested in, they'll instantly begin to find an interest and a curiosity around what you do. And one thing leads to another. OK, so those first videos, how many of them were there? Half a dozen maybe or so. I mean, literally camera on a tripod, static, talking for a hell of a long time, jump cuts. Um, and they went up on YouTube and that was where it started. Did they do well from the beginning? Well, in terms of they did better than... More people were watching than we had friends. It was more yeah. than just our mums watching it. Yeah. So we were like, actually, that's interesting. We're getting comments from other places. And although the, we'd written a cookbook and they were kind of my food ideas originally, yeah. what was great was the first time we were like this is better than us just preaching a load of stuff. This, there's now this kind of two-way interaction where people are asking for stuff. Somebody's requesting this. Well, let's see if we can do our version of it. And that's, I think, when it clicked that actually there was this whole demographic of people out there who needed what we had around that pub table yeah. as much as we did. And they, they were spurring it on. And that's where, you know, over time, slowly it became more and more serious. And there was a period where we were doing daily video recipes. Whoa. Seven a week, and we did that for about six months. Huge back catalogue of, of simple how-to recipes, and each and every one was like inspired by the community in some way. And that's when we realised there was a huge demand 
for food on the platform because at the time very few people were doing it you're one of the pioneers because 10 years ago there were very few consistent food channels and then jamie did really well and, and there's loads of food channels now but back then it wasn't it wasn't the done thing it wasn't the, the programming as having a schedule and having a, a release time and a, and a particular formatted thumb or all of that was kind of just evolving and we were kind of making up the rules we went along it's bizarre to look back and think that in some ways that's kind of helped forged how it's done yeah because we had an idea and we tried it and it worked and we had another idea we tried it that didn't work so we went back to the first one but you kind of you try and test on the platform we did a lot of that you've also helped people work out that being friends sells (laughs) which is kind of weird it must be you're like oh we've commodified our relationship in a really lovely way In in a way that means we still get to spend you know pretty much monday to friday and sometimes more when we're traveling and stuff together and it is the best job in the world it's difficult to use that word yeah. um we work very hard us and the whole team but it's not work no. it's good fun and and we literally come to work with our best friends and get to cook all day and create stuff that we love and have this conversation with people all over the world that get up in the morning and allow us to do it again and again and again some of the things i love about this industry it's like you can do entrepreneurship very differently and it's it is starting a business and you've got to do taxes and legal contracts and all that boring shit but you get to actually build something of value where you feel very close to the people you're making videos for and close to the people you're making vis- videos with and you get to do it in a different way so it's not like you're flogging stuff on a market store no you, and you're kind of making the rules up and it's done in a frictionless way and i know when we started the idea of the fact that it was a production team of four of us and maybe two more and it's like a, a tight team of maybe six that were producing videos we then speak to production companies and we were lucky enough we appeared on a few sort of cooking shows as guests and stuff for a good food channel and stuff like that and the production team there they're huge yeah 12 15 20 25 there was a series with itv and i remember just seeing the call sheet and thinking there's 30 people here waiting for me to introduce the show like so much unnecessary pressure it's the way it's done it's a different industry but when you realize actually now on youtube the reach and the the engagement we can have is on par with so many of those food channels on terrestrial tv and yet we're doing it with a small team and we've got control of it did it ever give you imposter syndrome where you're like oh god these huge production teams make us feel like we're not doing it properly or did it kind of cement that you knew you're doing things the right way we've always just followed what felt good but we did feel a bit sort of rebellious at times because it's like maybe this isn't the way it's done publishing was the same like there's a certain way that publishing works and there's certain cycles and you have an idea and the idea is pitched and you write a book and then eight nine months later it hits the shelves sometimes it's even longer than that and we're like that's ridiculous like we've moved on to two or three four more new projects by then how do we do it quicker and more simple and, and get it into the hands of the people who want it in another way and that's that's why we did the kickstarter a couple of years ago and we're like actually let's not rely on a publisher to commission it and fund it up front let's sell it straight to people who want it from day one and then create it for them with them in mind let them help shape it and it then we can send those copies out and it's exclusive and it's what we want and what they want and by the way you'll have it by christmas which is three months we probably should get going like and that's that's always the way we've done it. it's like let's i know publishing has worked like that for decades but does it still have to? Yeah, let's shake it up a bit. I think that, yeah, that's really funny because the Kickstarter, I did an Indiegogo for a charity project once and we did say we'd deliver things by Christmas and then it came up to beginning of December and there you are writing, like wrapping and writing, handwriting to post things and going to the post office and the post office looks at you like you're mad. They're like, what are you doing? Did you did you have that experience? We did. Um, we had, you know, a thousand books uh, uh, which we were, you know, signing and, and wrapping and, and sending. But the thrill was that sometimes as vast as it is on YouTube with hundreds of comments underneath the video in the first handful of hours, it is very difficult sometimes to connect with that. Yeah. Whereas you know this is a physical thing that's going in the physical post and somebody's going to put it through a physical door yeah. and it's going to sit on somebody's physical shelf or in their kitchen and they're going to cook from it. Yeah. That's different. And I think that it doesn't matter then at that point because you're, you're driven from a slightly different yeah. purpose. Yeah, I, I get it. It was when people were saying like, oh, by the way, I've got this and I'm giving it to my daughter. And I was like, what? Like, this the thing we made is now a present like what it and it it's nice to see how it fits in someone's life when we set out to do sorted and i, I remember there's something that barry always said was that he was like i just i don't really know what this is going to become but wouldn't it be cool if one day it could somehow 
have an influence on people's lives and the way they cook. And we didn't really know what that meant at that time. It could have been a handful of people or whatever, but the fact that now as many people engage with the content have potentially changed their attitudes towards food, their opinions of food, they've tried dishes they would never normally have tried, or it's forced them to get friends around to eat because they've made something that was too big just for themselves. But it's just, it's amazing how food is something that brings people together time and time again. It is a catalyst for socializing and for friendship, which is why I think Sorted works. Yeah, I think that's one of the things you've kept really close is like community, the sense of community. And it's not just between the four or five of you, it's between your audience as well. Yeah, and I think when we when we get the opportunity to do physical things, whether it's meet up with them, uh, meetups, we've hosted some supper clubs and stuff. And when you actually get people around a table, that's when you realise that that's the value. It does extrapolate on, on YouTube to a huge scale in every country and every language and every cultural background that we could never honestly understand ourselves we have this input from them and we sit as almost conductors like we just feel like we're mastering the conversation and we're learning from them we're just sitting it down putting it back out hopefully in an entertaining inspiring way that draws more people in and everyone learns and then off the back of that we learn again and it's kind of it's quite moving to know that that silly little thing that we get up to sometimes when the camera rolls is doing something good I hope. And not we hope. People- it's funny because food is, is something that is kind of inherently, I think it's very real to people, but it's also not seen as like a social good. But you get to bring people together and change the way they eat and make them feel more healthy. And it's amazing you're doing that through like fridge cra- fridge cam. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> kind of that's, I don't know how many episodes of us talking into a fridge now. It's almost like a comfort blanket. Mm-hmm. There's nothing more silly than talking into a fridge. And therefore, whatever we say is going to be better than that. And it's almost like it's our wardrobe into Narnia for us like, it does feel like that it? it's it literally like, like that. beyond that anything's possible and we've got this direct conversation with people who are watching mm-hmm. and um, choosing to spend huge amounts of time not just scrolling past but minutes and minutes and minutes of content that they're engaging in and then sharing and commenting and that is our window into into that community really it's pretty cool you've constructed a real window <laughs> through a fridge yeah cool. you i mean you're not normal people well <laughs> in some well, way i mean you, you remember from your time at um youtube but we did um uh, a brand cast yeah. um thing during the, and during the beacons and one of the things was to have a fridge there that um youtube literally cut the back out of so that anyone could step into the fridge with a camera behind it and get their selfies taken at an event and uh, at the end of the event um they said we've now got a fridge that we've cut the back out of and it's not really much good to us. Would you like it? And it was like, fridge came just been upgraded. Because up until then, we would literally put a camera in the back of a fridge and we'd have to film quick enough before the lens steamed up. Seriously? Yeah, because it would get too cold. Like, it was a working fridge and we'd move stuff around and put a camera in it. And only... Ne- only Did that give you, what, like four minutes, five minutes? Yeah, just something quick to shoot and talk into a camera before it got too cold. If we're going back to when you were first launching those six videos... Where was the the kind of furthest or most unexpected cookbook order from? Do you remember a moment where you were like, oh my God, we're posting this to Azerbaijan? Yeah, like, well, literally all over the world. So um, off to Australia. I mean, English speaking was still yeah. predominantly it. So Australia, Canada, um, all across America, but some in South America as well. It was just insane. And, and watching the videos too, the beauty of YouTube analytics is you can see everything. And, and back then it was pretty obvious when certain things were popping up in different territories because we were looking at 100 views you could see whereas now broadly speaking you get a feel for which areas um but yeah you can kind of see everything it's kind of mad at 21 did you feel powerful sounds it sounds strange but like you're you're living quite a fun existence with your friends yeah but you're having this impact where you're selling a product internationally and i think in the early days i don't think any of us thought much more would come of it the idea of it was something that was just out there, wouldn't it be cool? I don't think at that point, none of us had committed full time to it. We all had other jobs. We were still studying and, and doing our degrees or whatever. Yeah. So at the early stages, it was just this cool side project, a bit of a hobby. Yeah. Um, it took a couple of years to become serious enough for a couple of us to take it on full time rather than working evenings and weekends to pay for that thing we wanted to do. And then bit by bit, more people came on board and, you know, now we're a team of 15 people, which is incredibly tight-knit team and everyone knows exactly what they're doing and it's a well-oiled machine and we create amazing content, we think, for yeah. 
our audience and the club and everyone involved and no point in that journey if we ever look back and gone how do we get here because each step was just a tiny little extra thing it feels like it really snowballed which because you've added on so many extra bits and every brand deal is more fun and more challenges and more people and I think or like the podcast like it feels like you've added on bits that feel very natural but actually they've all kind of been transformative and added something else to the business yeah and it's it's I guess it is just like hopscotch. You jump from one bit to another and eventually you get to the end. And I think people, we often talk about um, a zigzag approach, which is like people see zero down here 10 years ago and where we are now and they draw a straight line. And wasn't that amazing? It's like, well, well, you didn't see the bit we went off here and we created our own beer. And then we did this bit and we did that and we did this and we did cookware and we tried this and they haven't all worked. But you quickly learn from all of those and work out what does work and you end up in a place and then wonderful people like you just draw a straight line and just say aren't you amazing and we say yeah don't look under the rug (laughs) (laughs) but they were all they were all opportunities to learn something um and not just from a business point of view and a strategy point of view but actually what do we want to do what do we want to create what does our audience want to see and ultimately it's not us and them we're the same people it's the same audience we're the same age we're the same we're peer-to-peer so we always have the same values in mind yeah i feel like you learn more from failure as well which like Absolutely. success is great but you just keep doing the same thing and because it hasn't failed you haven't had to tweak that much but if you fail at something you're like right where did it go wrong and what could we have done better and that's where i think you 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 kind of yeah just become a better person yeah we, we've never had a um a physical space like a, a restaurant or a pub and and maybe one day that is a dream but i remember in the early days i did a lot of agency work yeah. So I would jump from day to day or week to week into different kitchens, hotels, pubs, um, community centres, like uh, nurseries and cooking for like three-year-olds, like really different jobs. But it was always a chef stepping in to do a role. And some of those were not great experiences, but I would say I learned more from the places so that if I ever were able to set up a place, I'm definitely not doing it that way or that way or that way. And you learn more, you're absolutely right, you learn more about how not to do it from all those opportunities than than taking a few nuggets which you do as well but um i think you know you take those experiences you log them and they might not mean much at the time but several years later something else pops up another opportunity and you suddenly go yeah we could do that but we need to avoid that yeah. and there's like a gut reaction where you're like hang on i remember being really miserable in that situation what was the reason why okay if we have a culture it will not be like this or we will not have this process that made me unhappy and now you kind of get to set the rules in your own team as well we and do. you employ people like you get to set rules for them yeah it's true and i think the team is what makes it everything kind of work easier in the sense that you're not we've never been a single creator in a bedroom with a webcam working out how to write a script or speak into a camera and then edit ourselves like we've always had each other to bounce off of and the different people editing to being on camera and basically going that was a bit rubbish we'll cut that whereas sometimes like oh but i really you know that's what i wanted but actually it's by bouncing ideas around and the brainstorming and not rushing into things too quickly let's have an idea let's jot it all down get on a whiteboard scribble a few things around see what everyone thinks sleep on it for a night for a weekend come back to it next month and we've got some time and you come back to it and go what were we thinking <laughs> but because you've got the team you can kind of do that sometimes when you're on your own you're just like eh, i have to do that because it's we're on a tre- treadmill of life and i've just got to get it done and you're like it's the only thing like only path you can see which is when you've got a whole group of people the ideas you come up with are so much better because you'll think differently and bring something else. And we're all in different circumstances in our own lives between like, like Jamie's married with two kids, Barry's got a child. Like we're all in different places and we have different demands on food, on our lifestyles. We don't have different tastes and preferences of what we like to eat and cook and cuisines or styles of food. Um, so even between those of us you see on screen, yeah. that's helpful. But to know that there's two times as many of that off screen as well and we're all bouncing ideas around recipe labs and everyone gets to taste stuff and try stuff and pass opinion um then that's really strong as a 15 but we're still only really almost puppets to this huge global audience who actually teach us more than we can teach them in the first place i want to go back to kind of the beginning so you said you did the cookbook you had six videos started doing well and then what happened i think it was the response to some of those videos and the realization there were comments and more requests and suddenly somebody wanted a particular dish that we hadn't done and we almost felt obliged that they'd gone to the effort of watching those that we should probably find an answer for them 
And in a way, that's what sorted was. Right back in the start, the name came from getting something sorted. Yeah. Just let's find a solution and get it done. Let's get it sorted. And that was kind of it. It was so at the end of every title. It was. <laughs> I noticed I was looking, I was like, oh, sorted. Yeah. It, doesn't, it didn't translate very well because in America, it literally means organised to get something sorted into order. Um, so it didn't quite translate as well as we'd wanted, but um, that was it. It was like, let's get it done. Let's find a solution. So when people are writing in saying, that's great, but I've never been able to cook a risotto the way that we have it on holiday in Italy, can you show us how? I was like, yeah, of course we can. And we should, because you've asked. And it was almost like a drive for it. Um, What was your life like at the time though? Like, did you go back to uni, all of you? You were separate, like, how did you come together to make the videos to carry on going? So right in the early days, um, we built a kitchen from flat flat pack uh, Ikea, pretty much stuck together with Velcro. Um, in a corner of a barn of a family friend and we would just like stick it there and thanks, that's great. And we would film on a Saturday because that was the only time that everyone could actually get together because Jamie, Mike had real jobs. Um, so we would plan and I'd write recipes and test recipes during the week and Barry would be editing what we'd shot previously and we were sort of doing that during the week and then we'd shoot on a Saturday. That, I mean, that was very early days. Um, and how long did that go on for? a couple of years of that kind of dipping in and out part-time um in a position where it's not a at that point a career it's a dream and it's we're building something we can see it growing but was anyone working on it full-time at that point we were putting in a lot of hours but we were definitely having to work elsewhere say agency work barry was doing a lot of wedding photography jamie was working for a marketing agency so we had a proper job and um and mike was the one that had a proper job for the longest because he was a teacher and he was the last one to sort of of, of the four of us to, to quit his job and come and join us full time yes, which is a serious like commitment yeah. which like well when and how and I think it's when you start to see for the first time revenues coming in was it a moment where you're like oh we've got this certain number of subscribers was it views was it ad revenue was it brand deals what was the moment you're like hang on actually this might be able to support us I think it was it was momentum seeing an opportunity in the sense there was growth like every year it was doubling so in the first three years, double and double, it's going somewhere. But it, that numbers don't mean anything unless you can monetize it. And it was teaming up with some very early brand partners. Um, we saw opportunity. We did some stuff for Good Food Show and, and bits and pieces where we were cooking on stage and live demos. So we could see various different opportunities. The book was still selling, which was good. So there are a lot of different avenues that collectively made it possible i think ad revenue was probably the least of all of those um for a long long time and still is you know it's not um it's not the answer but it is some of the parts um so it was really all of those things and then some sort of early sort of uh, investment kind of in terms of like somebody going actually give it a go and a bit of mentoring and enabling us to give it a go and, and to play so it was actually barry's dad so he was just like actually if you want to go for it we can help you shape this and give it a bit of structure and play. And he he also admits he didn't really know where it was going to go. And thought as we started building this random set in a barn that we were a bit crazy. Um, But he had the trust and faith to go actually just just try it and just see it. And that's when it was a friend of a friend's barn. And and that's where it was kind of a lot of pulling of favours and a lot of sacrifice. But... I think if you if you believe in something enough, you can make it happen. Okay, so when Barry's dad was first like, come on, give it a go, was it utterly terrifying? I imagine it probably was. But looking back, I don't remember it being so. And I think it was just because every step was like, there's a bit of success. We've kind of broken the mould. Like, that's not how it should be done. And we've done it this way, so maybe we're in for a chance. There was a little bit of the, the underdog. Like, when we're speaking to people, people quite like the the gutsy straight out of uni giving it a go breaking a few rules but kind of getting there I think that played to our favour um, I don't remember it ever being terrifying there have been moments where you're like now we take a leap you know we're taking on professionals who are much better at what they do than, than we ever could and there have always been friends of friends or introductions um, but it wasn't like the core of us and it was like actually there's a requirement to make this work now because there's other people I mean, kids as well. That's the other thing that would terrify me. Like, paying for people's rent in London I scares me. And that's one of the reasons growing the team's fun. But knowing people have kids and you're like, that's or a wedding to fund. Yeah, there's like, a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's, got, it's got to work. And, it, and, and I, it goes back to the thing. I think we are 
so close as a group of friends that the moment it starts going left or right, we can all sit down and work out how we fix it. And there's no, there's no egos. There's no, there's no hierarchy. It's just kind of like, we're in this together. And there's, there's too many videos out there now, which means we're not going to get proper jobs. There's too many ridiculous videos of us doing silly things that we're never going to get proper jobs. So we've got to make it work. Are there moments you've ever sat down and, and just someone's had like a really, is, is like making a really big life choice and you're all like, no, stop, what are you doing? <laughs> no, well, I don't think so because we've always, we've always believed in each other. Be like, kids, right now, no. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> How are we going to support you? It's a family decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a group decision. A um, no, I don't think so. And, and, and there have been times when all of us have had particularly busy times and stuff like that. And again, I think that comes down to the, the friendship and the trust of the, yeah. if you need to leave and go for whatever reason, family, mental health, your own wellness, whatever, you don't need an excuse. The, and there's, a, there's yeah. an instant trust there that just means actually, of course. That's amazing as a business structure because I think a lot of businesses, you can get really annoyed with people when one person feels like they're doing more than the others. And over 10 years, there have been ups and downs, but it all balances each other out. It's like, never been a fan of the people when you go to the pub or out for a night out and everyone's counting, every, oh, you owe me this and this and actually should we split this, this? No, just I'll get this one, you get the next one. It will work itself out. And I think... Again, pub table analogy, but that's how we kind of run the business. It will work itself out. Yeah, you trust that everyone's kind of good people and not yeah. looking to screw everyone else over. <laughs> Makes sense. You're like, oh, we're actually supporting each other. Actually, it's going to work. And there's no, you know, we don't, the good thing is we don't always agree on everything. That's the really good thing because that's where you get the actual, the, the challenges and, and the things like you don't end up going down the wrong way and just agreeing with it for the sake of So we sometimes disagree but never to the point where it can't be fixed by a beer at the end of the day. So I was going to ask, there's no drama, no one storms off, none of that, yeah. You don't seem... No hissy fits, not many. I mean, you're a little bit, that's fine, yeah, cool. Um, and so what subscriber number were you at when... Because I think a lot of people, the reason I ask is, I know people get caught up on the numbers, but I think a lot of YouTube creators uh, forget those pivotal moments mm. or especially aspiring creators look at it and they're like, oh, if I... Did they have 100,000 subscribers when they became full-time or did they have... Yeah. A million. Well, I, actually, one of the um, our sort of core brand partners we've worked with for seven, eight years now, so Kenwood, yeah. they have been, we almost joke, they're almost like the extra member of the team when it comes to, they've been in our kitchen, passively and actively in the, in the kitchen forever and ever. And I think that was probably a defining moment, was super early on. And we had five, 10,000 subscribers. And we were speaking to the great team at Kenwood and literally right then they kind of, took a bit of a punt with us and said actually this is really interesting we like what you're doing we don't know where it's going either as, as little as you do but actually we're gonna work together on something for six months and that was kind of the first time we we're like okay somebody else is trusting us it's not just our own crazy idea and we got some some kit and some you know a check to help sort of be a part of that passive placement and then we create bespoke videos and, and then every year that would just relationship would just grow and it was with Kenwood that we did a lot of the live demos at the Good Food Show. Um, we did some stuff for, for their app and they were in our videos and it was and always has been a very sort of two way relationship and we still work to this day with the Kenwood team and it's the same team, it's the same people. That's and awesome. Because agencies, that everything changes, but like brands, I think often you can develop those real relationships. And it's a really good, you know, it's a good British brand and we know where it's based. We know the people in the business and it's, it just works. And I think that was the defining moment. It was like somebody else in a very grown up job trusts what we do and sees value in it for their business. Um, so maybe we are onto something. I think that was that was a defining moment. I can't remember five or ten thousand subscribers. That's amazing that they found you. So did they find you or did you find them? I think we were probably between kitchens. We were like, we need to. We've been kicked out of this barn. We need to find somewhere else or whatever. And that was a moment like, oh, we, we we could do is a some kitchen equipment. I wonder if we could start a conversation that's more grown up as opposed to just buying it when it's cheap on eBay. So go on. I feel like I have to ask you because you're the chef one. I mean, everyone cooks. Everyone's great, but what was your favorite utensil when Kenwood were like we're going to give you some stuff what was the equipment you were like it still is the mini chopper <laughs> it's a tiny little thing um but it's great it's pocket it's pocket size and yeah. we use it for everything I thought you were going to say like a slow cooker or something no anyway, you're not one of those are you? I, I love a slow cooker I love a pressure cooker I love a sous vide machine I love all the science around cooking but that was just like a little compact 
mini chopper. You, that's a big brand to have support you for a long time. Okay, that's really cool. That's really cool. And, and I think it was that same year was the first time that we went to VidCon. And suddenly we were like, whoa, we're traveling halfway around the world to go to this video conference thing with other people who are making it their jobs and meeting brands and we had a spot on the main stage even right back then super early and we're like what well, how something must be working um and i think it was just because food does resonate with people everyone has a passion point around food everyone has an opinion on food everyone can relate to it um so whereas there's lots of pockets of stuff on youtube and lots of different categories they don't tend to cross over food was a really easy one and right back then we did some collaborations with um, Joe Penn, a mystery guitar man. We did some stuff with Charlie. We did some stuff with uh, Daystorm. We did some stuff with Grace and Mame. Right, right back then. You're like old school YouTube. <laughs> exactly that. But it's they were in so different mini genres. And yet they all had an opinion on food and we could cook for all of them. Oh, Olga K. Um, like really awesome old school YouTubers. And I'm talking, yeah, eight years ago or more. Um, but, and fair play to them because they were all a hell of a lot bigger than we were. But we could cook for them and that was our gift and we, and we could have a bit of fun and again it wasn't about the food really it was the fact that we could have a laugh on camera and food was just like this catalyst okay you've the, the tough thing is there are so many different avenues i want to go down now i think community is the next one we should go down because you're talking about community of creators together there's community of friends and there's community of your audience which seems to really drive you um how do you feel about the way the community's changed now because i mean you look eight years later a lot of those creators aren't on the platform anymore and you're still there like you're like guys we're surviving well yeah and I, I feel like we're still treading water um <laughs> paddling like mad <laughs> under the surface the youtube community i think the wonderful thing about what we do and i'd love to say it was deliberate but food is evergreen if you want to know how to cook an Nando's Piri Piri chicken recipe or a white chocolate cheesecake the recipe we did eight years ago is as relevant for you today as it is now um or back then and yes back then production quality was very different format style was different haircuts were even worse than they are now but ultimately the recipe still works because it was tried and tested back then we never put out anything that wasn't tried and tested and worked it was simple and people still are cooking those so i think food is evergreen whereas sometimes music styles um comedy styles fashion they will change um, and as an audience changes, people can come and go. Um, so in terms of creators, we've been very lucky in the sense that we can constantly change the food, but food is constant. Um, but in terms of our community, and, and some people say the platform's changed and all that, we've never seen that change. Like, we've never had any negativity under our videos. That's, I mean, great. Trolling on videos is a thing, and we've never seen it. And occasionally, if it creeps in, We've got such an incredibly loyal audience and community now that they jump in long before we can and they don't have a go, they just correct the person. Yeah. Actually, I know you don't agree with the way they've done this, but what sort it does is X, Y, and Z. And if you want the version you're looking for, they did it two years ago, it's here. That's awesome. And the, the whole community self manage themselves and continue to grow. And we don't have trolling. We'll do some meat content on a Wednesday and some vegan content on a Sunday. And the two audiences are pretty similar. There'll be some overlap, there'll be some differences, but nobody needs finds the need to have an argument against any of it. Yeah. Um, it's just rich conversation. The channel's interesting because you've been so, in some ways, so consistent, even though you've done new series and added new people and new videos, um, new formats, actually you've grown quite consistently. And you haven't kind of ever tried to jump on like, a vegan hype just for the sake of it or we've had to stick true to what we are and i don't think any of the five of us are vegan material but we all understand the need to eat less meat to eat more healthily to provide a balanced diet when the community asks for stuff we absolutely want to give them a solution we want to get it sorted but it'll only ever be let's say 10 percent of our audience is vegan 10 yeah. percent of our content might be but that's we don't sort of go wholly any one way we try and do a real mix between baking and savory and different cultures and cuisines and fusion and kitchen gadgets or 
topical trends in the future of food we try and kind of do a little bit of everything and you've never shamed people which i really like there's a lot on youtube about shaming other creators for their eating habits or shaming and it's just like it's too much drama and i feel like we've got enough shaming going on between the four or five of us (laughs) we bully each other enough we bully in each other enough it's fine it's great and i love it i love watching you mean to each other um are you gonna be like pasta grannies you can get super old like be on YouTube. I mean, the grey hairs are starting. It's fine. So it's falling apart. It's terrible. Falling it's literally apart. terrible. So the other thing I want to ask, like, when you, how close have you got to your audience? So you said you you love how they like buy your books, but do they ever send you recipes? Have you ever met any of them and thought, like, you you told us a great wedding story before? Yeah, uh, it's like we are, and there are moments where you, it just is super touching. Like we are so connected with that audience. There are people who there are people that talk to us. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram more regularly than their own decade old friends. That's just a fact. And and, and twice a week we're there in new video, but we're all across the social channels every day and we're having that constant conversation. And it's more than just a chat. There are recipes coming in. We've done um, some of our books within the Sorted Club. They've all been inspired by community recipes. We did the bucket list which is a list of what should be your on your bucket list of the 50 dishes that you must do before you die. Morbid, I know. But f- celebratory food and why. And it was a mixture of different chefs, other creators, us in the studio and our team that you don't always see on camera, but also a huge selection of um, the community who have been following us for so long. So their recipes become a part of it. And then we get this recipe come in that's been handed down through generation of something we've never heard of from a cuisine we barely know anything about. We get the opportunity to cook it up and photograph it and put it in a book and we've learned something. Yeah. And it's, I think the bucket list book is one of my favourite for that reason because you flick through and every page is a story and it's a story that someone has shared with us and it's just really, really touching in that way. And when you travel, you said you often go and take people's recommendations. You're telling us about staying with subscribers. It's been a crazy 10 years. But in that sense, now everything we do is led by our audience. So Game Changers is our latest um, sort of travel series. And we've got this ambition to change the way that our generation travel. When you get to a place, how do you uncover the best stuff? And we've come up with kind of like three rules that get you in a good position where you can actually truly experience a place. You mean more than TripAdvisor? It's not the top 10 on a TripAdvisor, a Google, a Time Out. They're there and some of them are well worth doing. And it seems silly to go to a city and not do some of those things. They're iconic and you have to. But how do you find what the locals do and the hidden gems and how the families in that area are actually eating and cooking? Um, So we always go for local recommendations. Um, How do you source them? Do you say like we're going to... Next use the time. community tab on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We just reach out. And then if people give us suggestions, um, sometimes we'll get back in touch with them directly. Um, sometimes meet up with them, have Skype. Sometimes we do meet and greets, which is just... And I think this is the difference between... Which we realised early on in, in the VidCon days, where we'd be in a big hall and we'd have a meet and greet session. Whereas everyone else, creators would stu- be stood there with a line of people who want to come up and interact with them. And this audience would come up with their phones out and they'd want a selfie. Our audience come out with their phones up, but they don't want a photo. They want to show us what they cooked last week or where they went. And they're literally showing us this great food that they've cooked or been inspired by or that they want us to have a go. And I feel like the relationship we have is much more than just creator, influencer. Yeah. It, well, it's also it's because there's something tangible. It's the way you've impacted their life that they can share with you. It's not like... An admir- like it is an admiration but it's not a blind admiration or they feel like they're, they obsess over your personal life it's like you've shaped each other yeah. which is I think quite different they don't want a photo with you to boast about they want to be like what do you think of my pasta exactly and I think that's that's more humbling and more touching than actually anything else because that's the reason we started we started because the people around the table weren't cooking and weren't inspired to cook and didn't have the skills to cook and weren't taught at school and there was, we talk about this cooking gap, which is a whole generation of people who are no longer taught at school um, because of curriculum changes. And they might be taught design technology and food technology, but not how to cook on a Monday night, Tuesday night, or Wednesday night. And um, so they rely on being taught by their parents. But we're now of a time where the parents weren't taught. So we have this cooking gap of people who are just like having to resort to the internet and a handful of idiots online who are messing around, but hopefully they're able to learn elements of cooking along the way just gonna ask you favorite subscriber story 
time where you've like a subscriber's impacted your life or you've met them or some something interesting was on it oh so many um so we the the project we did with android pay a few years ago so it was a sponsored project and they came to us with a challenge which was there wasn't enough trust in contactless payment in the uk some people using apple pay but didn't really know or trust android pay and how could we raise awareness for this function that was it that was the brief and and we thought well let's come up with a creative way of doing it and as is always the case mike and barry sort of bash ideas around we all chip in what we ended up with was we wanted to invite ourselves to our community celebrations and we're going to ask them what's your celebrations coming up soon and would you want us there and if we come (laughs) we'll bring some element of food we'll take the food to another level um and the best part is we will do it all with just a phone an android contactless payment and by the way it's hooked up to android's credit card so we all win and we got loads of suggestions from graduations to family barbecues to birthdays anniversaries but i think the one that stood out was a wedding and a couple who had been watching us for years um invited us to their wedding i mean that is just the most crazy situation they put on a table for us at the wedding it just insane and the lead up to it the 24 hours before we had to learn all about burfi indian sweets and and um i think it was like 250 wedding guests and the norm, normal thing there is you'd have like three or four pieces of burfi so it was like a thousand pieces of burfi we needed to make in 24 hours didn't even know what burfi was at that point so we had to do like the research and we were literally taken um by um uh, the bride and the, and, and uh, along um through wembley to to try different burfi and learn um and uh, the groom's mum and, and the groom and the best man took barry and uh, mike to get dressed up and all of this happened in a 24 48 hour period and it was just insane and there was that moment we were there at the wedding and we thought yeah this is a video and this is content and this is great and we've learned how to make burfi hopefully we've taught other people what burfi is and they've got a recipe they can go and create it so that's what sort is all about right but we're also at somebody's wedding and they have opened up their special day for us like they would any of their friends or family and that was a connection like there is more to this than just people you watch on youtube there is a connection that goes deeper and i think it was that moment that we just went wow that is phenomenal and how do we get to this position where somebody who watches us Trust you trusts us enough to invite us into a wedding also for a brand deal and that's the thing that's interesting as well because it's like it's not just them trusting that you'll turn up and you'll do a video but they know you're being paid to help as well which i think like often there's a lot of skepticism about sponsored content yeah but if someone's like please come to our wedding don't care if android's involved come to our wedding we we get so much positivity around the brand sponsorships we we do and again the influencer word and a lot of hashtag ad there's a lot of negativity around there's a lot of people who don't necessarily do it too well um but we have always said if we're going to work with someone they have to bring something to the table that we our audience don't already have access to facilities or experiences we can't have expertise or skills that we don't have funding yes so we can make it bigger and better and more plausible and then with that and with, with the brand's kind of concept or or objective in mind now step back and leave it to our audience to decide because then we want our audience and we ask our audience we're going to come to a certain destination and do it or we want to invite you to a celebration or we're going to do this thing with ford and we want to cook food in the back of a car but then the control is in our audience's hands so that we can give them what they want to see and then instantly everyone's on board and it works and those are the kind of collaborations that make such a difference and i think that are way more memorable as well do you um do you get sent photos of their kids? So honestly, we've we've done we've been involved in in weddings. Um, we've been had photo sent kids. We've had um, people who sometimes go into long distance relationships, and they connect through Skype or Hangout or whatever. But they've both cooked a sorted recipe and they eat it together while they chat. Like, but how amazing is that? That again, food and this recipe can connect people across cities and possibly thousands of miles and it is the food is that connection for for friendship relationships and, and all sorts you should keep like a wall in the office filled with photos of people sorted who have, like, babies. Got together yeah, and sorted <laughs> babies. 
So the other thing that I thought, well, a couple of things I wanted to touch on. So mission, you mentioned the cooking gap and how kind of you, you, the whole channel started from this frustration of people not like, eating ready meals rather than eating properly. Do you still feel like that mission drives you today? Yeah, because I don't think anybody else has found a way of doing it yet and to fix the problem. So I think food education, and not necessarily just how to cook, not necessarily just the basic skills of scratch cooking, but where is our food coming from? An understanding of the connection between farm to fork is talked about a lot, um, but actually what does that mean? And the connection of where our food is produced and the provenance and the storytelling and the passionate producers behind it. So much of that happens behind closed doors. So how can we join the dots and, and bridge some of those things? And there is a reality that a combination of agriculture and meat consumption and um, you look at diets and things like obesity and all, these are all the factors of what we eat and a system that puts things into place that enables us to eat and I don't think anyone is really addressing the education point of view in a way that our peers you and I want to engage with it yeah it's all quite um quite controversial a lot of the way people do it it's very like um oh, what's the word i'm thinking of controversial it's condescending it's it's that kind of like we're the experts yeah. we've done this scientific report we're the politicians we have this policy we we are above you here's our dossier it's it's 200 pages long it's our plan for food after brexit and here it is yeah. no one's going to look at it either inaccessible or very controversial very like look at how how awful the meat industry is and of course it's awful but you, they're doing it in a way that kind of shocks and shames people yeah. which I think you guys partly the friendship dynamic never comes across that way I think because between us we have different opinions which is good so we're not always one-sided um, and that helps but also we we do sit on the fence quite a lot I don't think Sorty's role is to have an opinion on left or right on any of these topics but it's great when we can just distill down the facts Dispel, dispel the myths and actually explain it in a way that is really easy and, and Mike is brilliant at that because he'll take all of the research and science and, and data that the rest of us have collected and I get really geeky on a lot of that stuff and then distill it down and then Mike will do a, a 40, 50, 60 second animated segment that just explains everything in terms that everyone understands anything from the future of edible insects to gut biome, to how flavour and aroma and taste combine to create an experience that you eat. And therefore, knowing that, how do you cook at home and make stuff up on the spot? All of that is kind of based around science, but in a way that is accessible, accessible and fun. And, and we enjoy making the content. And in theory, if we enjoy it, somebody else is going to enjoy watching it. That's kind of what we always hope. I can tell it's a litmus test as well. You like... You you're all very fun and you make it light-hearted which I think is massively missing and I think it's something especially young people who are trying to learn to cook or change their lives they don't want it to be serious or boring oh, and we, we desperately try to make everything we do something we want to do and sometimes it doesn't really make business sense to spend that much time or that much resource on something but if we believe in it we want to we want to do it um, and we always go above and beyond and uh, the whole team but I'd say Mike especially such a perfectionist and like everything has to be better than the time before and that's brilliant and I think if we continue to dr drive that and continue to let the direction be kind of steered by everybody watching engaging then it's really interesting and the podcasts are a great way of doing that we the podcast we've had behind um for the sorted club so exclusive once a week and we just sit down and we talk about trending food topics yeah and we can get quite passionate about that and sometimes it's led by a, a report or some science sometimes it's just opinion but you can go into that for 30 40 minutes more so than you can on on youtube so they're quite an interesting mechanism as well so what is the one thing you want people to take away from watching your channel good question um i think it probably is when was the last time you used food as an excuse to hang out with somebody that perhaps you haven't done for a while to have a new food experience and to, whether it's inviting people in or whether it's going out for a meal and the, you know, there's loads of great places, pretty much every city. How do you uncover the hidden gems in your city, a city you're traveling to, or how do you invite people into your home and cook for friends or family? And when was the last time you went a little bit out of your comfort zone to try something a little bit different that created a talking point at the table 
so that we can make food a conversation that we should all be having. And you mentioned this, so I don't know which angle to approach it from. What you said, you said, don't forget to ask me about eating disorders. Only because that, in terms of impact, yeah. and I think when we were speaking before, you said, what's the most impactful thing? And it's it's always a subject that we we do not know enough about, and we're not qualified in any way to to cover in a, in a professional sense. But we quite often have people, um, not quite often, but we occasionally have people write to us very very moving stories and and opening up a huge amount and you look at some of the threads underneath some of our podcasts are we addicted to sugar um all these different kind of which side of the fence do you sit on when it comes to meat consumption veganism all of those topics but but eating disorders is another one where some people have you know understand watching a group of friends have that much fun around food can bring a very positive look on food right we've got quick fire questions Uh-oh. quick fire questions <laughs> So, favourite YouTube channel that isn't yours? Ones we've been following for years, still love Grace, Mamory. Brand that you actually like? All the ones we're currently working with, of course. Kenwood, have worked with them for years and nice people. Your favourite cuisine? It moves around a lot right now. Um, Vietnamese, Southeast Asian, possibly Chinese. Your favourite drink? Gin. Phone or text? Text, unless you need to get a job done. Your dream brand deal? something that enables us to recreate the amazing experience we've had in Game Changers elsewhere in the world. So to go to where so many of our audience are, um, Singapore, Malaysia, and cuisines that might push us out of our comfort zone. If you could be any animal, what would you be? Definitely a dog. They're just the happiest people. Best place you've ever travelled for a brand deal? New Orleans was pretty cool, and we've recently been to Puerto Rico. Loved both of those. Your favourite social network? YouTube. Your least liked social network? Snapchat, I don't get it. Your uh, next holiday destination? Uh, we're off to America again soon and heading out to Japan. The worst fad on YouTube? Slime. I never really understood that. Because of we were in a Rewind video the year that slime was big slime, and we yeah. spent eight hours stood outside in the cold covered in slime because apparently it was cool. Your favourite ever advertising campaign? I feel like all the beer adverts, all the Carlsberg and... Yeah, it's just they're clever. Oh. Please drink responsibly. And your dream video, if money was no object, if you could do anything you wanted, what would the dream video you'd make be? You know, evolution of dance. We want to do evolution of food. From caveman, prehistoric man, right the way through to the future of food, space food and beyond. Oh, okay, so fun one. The last time you cried. Oh, that sounds fun. Um, That wasn't chopping onions. Probably watching some pathetic reality TV thing like America's Got Talent. Always gets me. Really? Real people. Real stories. Oh, who's your best friend in the world? You can only choose one. Best friend in the world? <laughs> Definitely my teddy. Well done. Well navigated. Well, thank you very much. I think you said some very insightful things, actually. Hopefully some meaningful things. They, they mean something to us. Yeah, it was, that was, it was deep. <laughs> a lot about food and community and then a lot of policy, actually. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. yeah. Food is an exciting time for food right now. Yeah, an exciting time for sorted. Yeah, good luck conquering the world. Thank you. Um, if you found anything Ben said interesting at all, anything, uh, please comment and then you can win this brilliant camera. He's oh yeah, do I get sign. to scribble on it? Get to scribble on it. He might even do, I don't know, draw a pie or something. I doubt it. You've <laughs> seen my drawing skills. <laughs> please comment something you found insightful and remember to tune in again for another creator. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Oh, it was really nice. It's glad. This is this is on the most sweaty, but at least uh, it was pretty warm, warm in here. Anything you want to plug to brands? They or know. To viewers? They know where we are. Come find us. Yeah. Come talk to us. Yeah. Come cook with us. And he didn't bring any cooking or no, baked goods true, to the office. Ben really let us down today. Really let us down. Next time. Cool. Thank you. I want these quesadillas. Right. Thank you and goodbye. That used to be the trick. We just turn up with a little bit of Tupperware or something or other. <laughs>